So, can I, there we go. No, I was not fishing for applause. It's my great honor to introduce our next speaker. He's a technical fellow in the data and storage platform division at Microsoft. That means he's less interested in what particular features going into the next version and looks a, a lot farther forward doing research and what's going on in the future. So he's trying to solve the problem that you're going to have a couple of versions down the road. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David DeWitt to the stage. Not a doctor. I have a daughter who's a doctor. She would say, Dad, you're not a doctor. Uh, I may be coming down with a swine flu, so I may call her later. Um, today I'd like to talk a little bit about technology trends and how those trends have affected um, how we architect database uh, systems. So I titled it From One to a Thousand MIPS. And for those, those of you that are old enough to remember VAXs, you'll understand where the one MIP came from. So first of all, I was really surprised and pleased to get invited back. Um, I guess that means some people did not fall asleep last year, uh, even though you had a late night last year. Still, I have no new product announcements to make. I have no motorcycle to ride across the stage. <laughs> last year, I was so intimidated by that motorcycle. It's like, wow, what a, what a conference. Uh, unlike Bob Moo, I don't have a 192-core server to catch on fire. Um, <laughs> Maybe, maybe next year you can get Bob to drive the forklift that listed that thing up on the stage instead of a motorcycle. But I did bring some blue books for the quiz because you know I always finish up with a quiz. So who is this guy? Well, I spent 32 years as a professor before Microsoft lured me away to, from academia. And I joined Microsoft about a year and a half ago. And I run sort of an unusual lab in Madison, uh, which is closely affiliated with the database group. And it's, the, the idea behind this lab was to establish a facility where uh, we could bring technology out of the research community um, through the, at the, data, the go, research that goes on in the database group at Wisconsin um, into the Microsoft product stream in a much shorter cycle than you would normally find from academic research into product. Um, this is an, sort of the first time any company has ever set up a laboratory like this. So we're not part of Microsoft research. My boss is this guy, Quentin Clark, who's this 39-year-old whiz kid uh, who has trouble managing this 60-year-old guy. Actually, I'm older than 60. So. Um, so I'm working, you know, we're doing a bunch of different things, but we're working on releases one and two of uh, what they call sometimes SQL parallel, SQL Server Parallel Data Warehouse. Uh, tweet if you think SQL Star would be a better name. Maybe I can convince the marketing people that that's a mouthful. Uh, if you skipped last year's lecture, last year I talked about parallel databases um, and about how Project Madison, as it's sometimes called, um, is architected. Now, when I talked last year, my boss warned me, he said, those slides are much too technical for this audience. Make it a marketing pitch. Uh, so I ignored him, uh, as I typically ignore my boss. <laughs> And in fact, the feedback was you like technical talks. So this year, I'm really going to give it to you. And next year, you won't invite me back, OK? So uh, I'm going to really dive into how technology has changed database world over the last 30 years. Um, I'm going to look at CPU trends, memory trends, and disk trends, and look at you know, how we're going to architect systems going forward. And finally, I think we're going to see, and I predict this, that we're going to see increasing database specialization going forward. Uh, we're going to continue to have general purpose database products, but I think we will see specialized warehousing products, specialized uh, products for doing high performance transactions, databases in the middle tier. Um, and I think it's evolution. You think about it, we've done a great job building products, all, the entire database field. Uh, but as uh, applications become specialized, I think database systems will become specialized. Um, now, this is an academic talk. People, you know, I was actually afraid Microsoft would not approve me giving this talk. I am not announcing any products. Do not infer anything from what I'm about to say. I'm not indicating any possible directions, but you might pay attention. Not announcing any products. <laughs> I'm not indicating any directions. How, however, this is good stuff to know. The field is changing, and the material I talk about will be part of those specialized database systems going forward. 
Um, so I decided to keep my boss happy by going to my other title. So I, I'm in this enviable position that I have a Microsoft title and I still have a university title. So you can just think about the rest of this talk as with my University of Wisconsin emeritus professor hat on, okay? So there's a chalkboard. We still use chalk in academia. So I'm a big believer in chalk talks. Okay, so here's the outline. I'm gonna look at 30 years of technology trends. Then I'm gonna explain how these trends have impacted OLTP performance, database systems for OLTP, database systems for warehousing, decision support workloads. Why these trends are forcing database systems to evolve um, and some solutions that have been uh, become popular and, and I think will be important going forward. Okay, now those of you that are old remember VAX 11780s. They were the first 32-bit mini computer and they really changed the world. The early relational products from Ingress and Oracle were written in C. They were able to migrate from PDP 11s to VAXs. Uh, that set Oracle and Ingress going forward. Um, but they were really pretty primitive if you think about um, what, your, uh, what your phone has for power today. So these things were, you know, four or five cabinets. Uh, they were one MIP processors. Um, there was about eight meg of memory maximum, not eight gigs, eight meg. Um, the disk drives were 80 megabytes. I remember a whole department of us shared 267 megabyte disk drives. So 30 of us were sharing 267 megabyte drives. And they were about a quarter million dollars. Um, Ingress and Oracle were the dominant uh, relational vendors. Uh, IBM was just getting started, but did not have a product that would run on the VAX, uh, never did. Um, but if you look at the architecture, if you look at how Ingress and Oracle were architected in those days, you see a query engine, a buffer pool, some disk. Um, the algorithms have changed, the technology has improved, but the basic architecture that we use in our products today across the industry um, is pretty much unchanged from what it looked like 30 years ago. So if you look at um, the configuration, um, you know, we had one MIP CPUs, we had about a K uh, of, of cache, 8K byte caches, two megabytes per CPU, 80 megabyte drives. And today we have two, you know, we've gone uh, to two gig, uh, gigabit per second CPUs, about one gig, two bit gig. Caches are a megabyte, main memory is two gigabytes per CPU, and disk are about 800 gigabytes or a terabyte. I like to write nice round numbers. Um, and I know you can really buy terabyte drives today. So if you look at this, you'll see, oh, we got a, about a factor of 1,000 in CPU performance, about a factor of 1,000, you know, give or take a little bit in cache size, um, memory size, and a factor of 10,000 in disk drive size. And, and this change is really, as we'll see some with some other issues, this has really impacted how we architect things and we'll architect things. But again, the design looks about the same. Now, I'd like to zoom in a little bit on disk trends. Um, and again, I, I, I wanted all the numbers to come out round. So, you know, I have 80 megabytes to 80 gigabytes, the factor of 10,000 I talked about in terms of capacities. But if you look at transfer rates, we've gone from about a megabyte a second to about 80 megabytes a second, depending on what's, what tracks you're looking at. So there, there's only a 65x performance improvement. But then if you look into seek times, we've gone from about 30 second seek time, 30 millisecond seek time, excuse me, to three millisecond seek times. So we've only gotten a 10x improvement out of the hardware there. These, these differences between these trends is a killer. Okay, and, it, and I'm going to follow that. So we've got 1,000x versus 65x versus 10x. So those will be on the quiz, so memorize those numbers now. Now, if you go forward to about 85, so I did my first benchmarking work. One of the things I did in the early 80s was benchmark Oracle. I got Larry Ellison very mad at me when I did my first benchmark. Um, Jim Gray, who my lab is named after, who's a good personal friend, Microsoft technical fellow, uh, who was lost at sea a couple years ago, um, he did the first debit credit benchmark, which then became TPCA and B. But if you look at what the state of the art was in 85, it was an IBM system running IBM, uh, M, uh, IBM IMS fast path. Um, and it could do about 100 transactions a second um, at four IOs per transaction, give or take a little bit. Uh, uh, but basically, one CPU, 100 transactions a second, and it only needed 14 disk drives to be balanced. Now, if you 
And the fastest relational products at the mar on the market at that time were about 10 uh, transactions a second. So if you go through to 2009 and you set up a SQL Server database and you put it on a flash, uh, like a fusion device, which we've uh, done with, and you run TPCB, which I know is not a uh, standard benchmark anymore, it's easy to get 25,000 transactions a second. And if you actually were to make that, you know, configure out a system and put disk drives on it, you would need 330 disk drives to keep that one modest, modest CPU going. So this is really, you know, things are totally out of whack. We've gone from, the, you know, getting good performance with one CPU and 14 drives uh, in mid-1980s to needing 330 drives to keep one processor busy. Uh, you know, CPUs and disk are totally out of whack in terms of performance. Now, the, and, and in fact, you can sort of think about it. This 1,000x improvement in CPU performance has been sort of negated by the fact that we've only gotten a 10x improvement in the number of seeks per second out of. And it's left us having to run our big OLTP systems with thousands of partially empty drives. Now, unfortunately, there's really no good solution. Uh, it'd be nice to say there's a solution for this. I actually think solid state disk and, and then phase change memory will really change our lives, especially phase change memory, um, which is predicted uh, three or four years out, because we'll build huge, huge systems out of phase change memory um, and those will be uh, run really high performance transactions on phase change memory, which is, a, which is persistent. Now, I'd like to spend the rest of my talk talking about how software solutions can fix this imbalance between CPUs and disk uh, for the data warehousing marketplace. Now, if you look at disk improvements, um, you know, the disk over the last 30 years have, have as I said early, earlier, changed dramatically. Now, first of all, these terabyte drives that we can buy now for a couple hundred dollars, uh, they've enabled us to collect an vast amounts of data. You know, you can't imagine, you know, you know how much more data we collect, um, you know, well, I'm sure you can, than we did 30 years ago. It's just, it's free to keep the data, essentially, except for the power bill. Um, so we've gotten, again gone, gotten this factor of 10,000 in capacity and this factor of 65 in transfer rate. And you might say, well, that's, you know, that's not too bad. But if you do the, the calculation transfer bandwidth per byte, you get a sort of different view of what's happened. And, and I, I, like, I like to think about this in terms of a, a town with a, a water tower. If the, the town with a water tower, you know, they got this big capacity, which is this big water tower. They tried to feed water to the entire city with a garden hose. That's sort of the situation we're in today with disk drives. We've got this huge disk drive and this very, very tiny pipe coming out of it. Um, and that tiny pipe, yeah, it runs at 80 megabytes a second. And yeah, that's 65 times better than it was 35 years ago. But that pipe is really, really small. And that's why I like to use this sort of weird metric everybody talks about is how, much, how, much, how big is that pipe per byte of storage? And if you do the division of um, um, uh, 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 1.2 megabytes per second divided by 80 megabytes, you get this number 0.015. If you do the same thing out of today's drives, you get a number that's 0.0001. And so in effect, the drives have become, in, 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 from my viewpoint, 165 times slower than they were. Um, a bunch of years ago. And you might say, no, they're 65 times faster. But it's, it's like I got this big disk drive, and I want to s take data, and I want to store the data on the disk drive, and I want to analyze the data, but I'm just given this little tiny water pipe to get the water out of the disk drive or the data off the disk drive. And I got to find a software solution to that problem if I'm going to build a scalable data warehouse that really will scale and allow us to analyze all that data. Now, another viewpoint is, is what's happened to the relative performance of random versus sequential. So as I said earlier, in 80, you could do about 30 random IOs a second at, at 8K bytes. You get about 240K bytes per second doing random IOs. Sequential transfers are 1.2. Sequential over random, 5 to 1. Now, in 2009,